everyone, I am Laura Thompson, one of the representatives from Callison Professional, and welcome to today's webinar on the safety and efficacy of Callison for facial rejuvenation, presented by Dr. Mitchell Goldman, Clinical Professor of Dermatology at the University of California, and Founder and Medical Director of Cosmetic Laser Dermatology in San Diego. He is also known as the Grandfather of Growth Factors and is the Co-Founder of Skin Medica. Just so you all know, you're all on mute. So if you have any questions during the presentation, please hold them until the end. Or if you notice at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A button. So if you click this, you'll be able to type in your question and we'll then have a 15 minute live Q&A with Dr. Goldman at the end. We'll also be running some questions at the end to get some more information from you and to learn more about our audience. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Goldman. How are you, Dr. Goldman? Pretty good, and thank you all for being here this evening, or morning, or afternoon, wherever you are. Amazing, over to you. Okay, so again, thank you for being here, and um, since we're virtual, we don't have to be wearing uh, these masks uh, any longer, but it, uh, it is very difficult times, and so this might be the way that we're gonna be conducting many of our meetings in the future. So let's see if I can make this work. So I am the chairman of the scientific board of Calisum, but I don't have any other financial disclosures to make. As Laura said, I have been involved in a lot of skincare uh, companies uh, starting way back in 1993 when I consulted for Johnson & Johnson in their wound healing division. And that's where I sort of got the idea to do uh, growth factor uh, work. I founded a, a company called Skin Medica with Dr. Richard Fitzpatrick in 1995. And what really made that company go is the use of growth factors in order to stimulate collagen and elastic fiber formation. It was a product called TNS or Tissue Nutrient Serum uh, that we developed with fibroblastic growth factors at the time, uh, which really took off that company. And, those of you that were following it know that uh, we sold it to the Allergan company about, I think it's five, six years ago now. And so Allergan now owns the product and I have no uh, ownership in it and I'm no longer associated with the company. <clears throat> I have been involved in a variety of other skincare companies, as you can see here. And so even though I'm a dermatologist, primarily doing cosmetic dermatology, uh, you can see that I've had a very broad experience with uh, the cosmetic skincare line uh, because you know there's just so much we can do in our office and it's always good for patients to be able to continue uh, to improve themselves uh, using skincare. Well, what brought me to the Cell Research Corporation and this product called Callisum is my interest in growth factors and when we developed the Skin Medica product, it was basically a fibroblastic uh, medium that was obtained from uh, foreskin fibroblast. And we basically took the culture medium, and interestingly, we were doing wound uh, healing research with it, and it actually did not meet any of the specifications for wound healing. And the company actually went bankrupt and then Dr. Fitzpatrick and I uh, bought the product uh, from the company, added it to a uh, topical formulation, uh, which was very elegant, and that became the TNS, which started the company called Skin Medica. So I've been involved in these uh, for a long time, but again, what brought me to Callisum is that they definitely have a different way of doing it, which is, I think, a lot better than what we were doing with fibroblastic growth factors. We know that there's different kinds of stem cells, as you can see here, and it, it, you do have different concentrations of stem cells, 
which provide, which actually act as a diffusion gradient to be absorbed into the skin. Um, what we also uh, find is that there's different quality of stem cells. Um, and so even though the original growth factors and some still today are used with fibroblastic cell culture medium, it turns out that it's about, it's not just the fibroblastic cell that you can get, whether it's from fetal foreskin or an um, umbilical cord, it's from uh, umbilical cord lining that really uh, works. And so that's basically uh, the mechanism of action of the callosum product. When you look at the umbilical cord lining, there's basically a mesenchymal cells and epithelial cells. So the mesenchymal cells have the ability to differentiate into a variety of, of cell types, including fibroblasts in the skin dermis and the skin and the dermis. But the epithelial ones are able to regenerate the skin uh, and lining cells, including the keratinocytes. So the reason the umbilical cord lining is way better than <clears throat> foreskin fibroblasts uh, is that you get the highest yield of stem cells, uh, 6 billion epithelial and 6 billion mesenchymal stem cells harvested from a single umbilical cord, um, as opposed to other sources like bone marrow and adipose cells and placenta and Wharton's jelly, which is far, far less. And so you get a much more robust uh, type of growth factors from these cells. <clears throat> if you look and compare the cord lining cells, which is used in the callosum products, with those from other sources, you can see that basically the cord lining cells are non-invasive because basically you're just harvesting the uh, placenta and umbilicus uh, from the red deer, which is who we harvest it from. It's processed fairly easily. As we said before, it gives you an extremely high yield of cells, uh, including the mesenchymal stem cells as well as epithelial stem cells. Um, and it is fetally derived because it does come uh, fl from the placenta. And so you get these really great expression of HLA-E, HLA-G, and other uh, important factors that we'll go through uh, in the following slides. <clears throat> it turns out that I actually tried to figure out which, which actual growth factors are the most important. And I actually helped develop a TGF beta a growth factor cream for a different company called Topics. And I realized that it's not just one growth factor that's important for stimulating dermal uh, reconstitution of collagen elastic fibers. You need that balanced mix. And it turns out that you probably get the best balanced mix of proteins from the cord lining cells because it basically directs cells to behave in a more youthful manner. Um, so the proteins work by sending out signals to cells and basically they encourage motility that we're gonna see uh, in the following slides. And they basically activate cells uh, to change cells from ones that are going to be dying to restoring the epidermal uh, turnover. So it turns out it's really the media is the message. When you look at the callosum cord lining stem cell source, we're harvesting it harmlessly from the New Zealand red deer. Now this is a herd of red deer in New Zealand, obviously, that is uh, basically free ranged, it's not endangered. And the way we got this red deer is they're actually using the fur from the antlers of a red deer as an aphrodisiac. And so uh, in order to, to, what we do is we basically just uh, harvest the placenta and umbilicus of the red deer. We don't, and maybe it is an aphrodisiac, I don't know, but uh, that's, that's for maybe another study that Dr. Lim and others can conduct uh, personally. But the umbilical cord is just deemed a medical waste. And usually if left in the wild, the deer just eats it. And so what we do is we just take it away from the deer. And the most important thing is no one is harmed during this process. 
neither the deer nor its fawn are harmed. And so it's very, very ethically uh, obtained. Um, there are a number of active ingredients in this cord lining. There's soluble collagen, albumin, um, fibronectin, hyaluronic acid, and then a whole number of consolidated peptides and glycoproteins. So these are the ingredients in the conditioned media, uh, which is in the Calisum product. We believe that it has the correct cell source um, and stem cells for regeneration and repair. It's very reliable. Um, we can grow it a number of times to get uh, very good um, growth factors and uh, cytokines as well. And it's stabilized with hyaluronic uh, acid. Now, when you look at the different competitors that also have cell culture media, the human infant foreskin fibroblasts, which is what I initially developed uh, with the uh, company Skin Medica, which was our TNS serum. Uh, basically, it was derived from keratinocytes, uh, the epidermis, um, and fibroblasts in the dermis, and they were already differentiated. So we found that it could stimulate growth and repair, but it, not too well. So not to the effect where we could actually heal wounds, but it does do something, and it does stimulate collagen elastic fiber growth. Um, the aborted human fetal skin uh, is another one that's out there. Um, and again, it basically is limited to fibroblasts and keratinocytes. And then the, there's a number of plant cell, stem cells that many different companies like Neocutis and others use. But unfortunately, although they're probably really good for growing plants, plant stem cell conditioned media really do very little, if anything, uh, to grow any kind of human uh, cells. When we look at uh, regulations, it's very important to know that European community regulations allow cell, do not allow, do not allow cell tissue or products of human origin. Uh, cord lining stem cell conditioned media does have a lot of dermatological applications. Um, what we can see initially is its anti-inflammatory effects. So one of the first uh, studies which was done was on patients that had laser resurfacing. And this is uh, Dr. Kim in Orange County who did a carbon dioxide fractional laser resurfacing uh, to the skin um, of this lady. And you can see that on this side, basically there was just normal aquaphor healing ointment. And on this side, the patient had the callosum uh, before uh, ointment. And you can see a marked decrease in both redness, swelling, and the patient reported discomfort on the side treated with callosum. So that's what really shows us that we've got some very good anti-inflammatory effects. If you look forward in a different patient, again, you could see increased swelling and redness on the side not treated with callosum, and the side treated with callosum has much less swelling, much less redness, and the patient record, uh, reports much less discomfort. And you can see patient heals very, very nicely after the procedure. There have been a number of other uh, patients that have been treated. This is a uh, controlled double blind split place trial uh, performed. And you can see the patient before laser. This is the side treated with the callosum, less erythema, less swelling on this side with treated with the callosum than the other side uh, not treated with the callosum. Uh, we can follow the patient out from before to three days later to seven days later, again, showing decreased swelling, decreased uh, erythema. And again, following the patient out to 21 days, again, decreased swelling, decreased erythema, uh, a hint of probably more rapid uh, healing using the callosum uh, products.
So this became the Callisum Professional Multi-Action Cream. Um, in another study, which we're going to be talking about uh, in the next few slides, not using a laser, but just using the cream alone, we found that it basically helped to lift the skin predominantly by forming new collagen and elastic uh, fibers, enhancing skin fullness and volume, all in a very elegant base. So these are patients that have not been treated with laser, just using the cord lining condition media, as well as the uh, Callisum multi-action cream. And you can see before and four weeks later, there's a lifting of the eyebrows. There's a lifting of the cheeks. You see an increased fullness, less eyelid uh, puffiness. As you can see, if you just look at the eyelids from here to here, and basically it just looks like a, a lifted patient. If we're looking at this patient here, again, you see a lifting of the the eyebrows, a lifting of the nasal uh, jungle fullness, and the, the jawline even appears uh, a little bit better with decreased jowling. You can see that better on the lateral view, again with four weeks of treatment showing increased fullness in the cheek, a more defined jawline, a much better appearance of the eyelid. So lifting procedures. That was an Asian patient. This is a Persian patient. Again, showing after four weeks, again, a lifting of the cheek, a, a definition and tightening of the jawline. If we look at a Caucasian patient, again, same thing. And here we actually see a decrease in erythema. So you have an increase uh, in the translucency of the skin um, more with a tighter uh, jawline, eyebrows, and eyelids. Another patient, again, not only are you seeing that tightening, but you're seeing a general improvement in the surface of the skin, a decrease in the abnormal pigmentation and erythema. So you have a number of different um, benefits, uh, improvement of overall skin complexion, skin tone in addition to the lifting uh, effects. On older patients, we also find that it works. So most of the skin um, companies will tr usually treat young patients um, because they have the most active fibroblasts that you can stimulate. But even the older patients, as you can see here, do get lifting and an improvement in their skin uh, texture and tone. And you see this just after four weeks of treatment. Younger patients, again, get an even better result with a more plumping and lifting of the cheek, as well as um, cheek elevation, as well as tightening around the jawline. So fuller cheeks, better appearance, and this is a six-week uh, follow-up. And in an Asian patient, again, just increased fullness. You can see less sallowness here, and the skin texture has a uh, better appearance as well with a decrease in the pigmentation. On the side view, you can appreciate as well both the lifting effect as well as um, this improvement in the skin tone and pigmentation. Another young patient, again, this is with eight weeks of use, improved facial contours, uh, radiance and glow. And so in our uh, office, we did a clinical study, um, which was actually published in the Journal of uh, Drugs and Dermatology, uh, showing um, basically a study of 20 patients, which was randomized, double blind, uh, placebo controlled, where patients use the Callisum products twice daily for 12 weeks. Um, the only other product they could use was a generic moisturizer and sunscreen. And we then basically graded them on a wrinkle scale uh, to assess wrinkles, skin tone, skin firmness, and overall satisfaction. Um, what we found at week 12 
is that patients reported significantly greater improvement in skin tone turgor with the active than the placebo with statistical significance. They also had an improvement of their wrinkles as compared with placebo uh, with statistical significance and patients were more satisfied with the active product than placebo, again, with statistical significance. These were some of our patients before and after 12 weeks. Here you can see this is a placebo showing very little, if any, change. And you look at the other side, which had the active compound showing a decrease in her wrinkling, lifting of the cheek, and an improvement in the skin texture. Another patient, this is a placebo side, showing essentially no change. And the active side, showing a lifting of the cheek, an improvement of her skin texture, improvement of fine lines and wrinkling. We then stud uh, studied the use pre and post ablative laser. And this was with, uh, again, Dr. Douglas Wu and two of my other fellows in my office. And here what we did is we uh, treated 15 patients uh, with the active product and five patients in the control group with just placebo. And a placebo you could see here was just a gentle cleanser and um, a sunscreen, a mineral-based uh, sunscreen, whereas the patients uh, we're using the calcium multi-action cream and serum in addition to the cleanser and the sunscreen. The type of laser we used, we used um, the Luminous uh, Ultrapulse CO2 Active FX, uh, one pass at 100 millijoules and 60 watts at a density five. Um, and then we did a second pass around the periorbital and perioral areas at the same uh, settings. Um, this is actually uh, one of the patients, uh, Doctor. Uh, he's actually one of uh, our physicians, Dr. Bruja, and you could see his uh, rapid healing uh, with full face resurfacing. Uh, this was a patient uh, with the uh, active product, again, showing an improvement in the skin texture, uh, as well as um, uh, increase uh, tightening of the skin. Another patient, again, 52-year-old, improvement of both skin texture as well as tightening. And when you looked at our patients in clinical improvement, you basically had a significant increase in improvement on patients in the active group versus placebo. Interestingly, we did not see that until week 12. And the reason is because if you're looking at patients in the first four to six weeks, it seems to be very similar because there's a lot of swelling edema. But if you wait another month or two, and that's why we brought the study out to three months, you could get a real idea of how the patients uh, really look. If you look at the wrinkling scale, again, you see less wrinkling uh, occurring uh, at day 30 in, in our patients. And then when you look at tactile uh, roughness and photo damage severity, again, a marked improvement, again, that you could see at day 30. Uh, and then when we look at tolerability, and that's about the uh, erythema that occurs afterwards, you can see that in the active group, at virtually every time point after day five, we had decreased erythema as compared to the placebo group also decreased dryness as compared to placebo group at day 30. And you can see an increased healing uh, happening at day one, and then at day 14, uh, mostly statistically uh, significant. Skin quality was also judged to be improved in our active group compared to the vehicle. And when we asked the patients if it felt soothing and calming, even immediately after treatment, it did be, it, the calcium products were very soothing and calming, which uh, went to 30 days of the study. 
Patients agreed that the callosum products in red uh, helped with post-procedure skin sensitivity. And then uh, the most important thing is how you would grade their experience and patients uh, preferred the callosum product to the placebo product across almost all time courses. So definitely post-procedure, it felt soothing and calming. And they graded their experience with the callosum product better than with the placebo product. So what does it mean? It means that the multi-action cream really does something on its own through intact skin, but when you use it following ablative procedures, it significantly reduces downtime and continues to improve the results of the laser procedure. And that, my friends, is uh, all I need to say at this time, and I'd like to open it up uh, to questions. Amazing. Thank you so much, Dr. Goldman. Um, so we've got a couple questions in the Q&A box. So we're going to run through those first. And then we're actually going to go uh, live to the floor. So you'll notice that at the bottom of your screen, there's a raise hand button. So if you have a question um, in a minute, we'll get you to click that. And then we can actually unmute you and you can ask your question live directly to Dr. Goldman. So Dr. Goldman, we've got one question here that is asking if it can be injected intradermally. You know, um, I have heard that people are injecting it intradermally and using it sort of like a PRP. Um, unfortunately, the product is not uh, approved by our Food and Drug Administration, FDA, to do that with. Uh, I also have not performed any clinical studies on injecting it intradermally. Um, I think that that is a very interesting idea and something that we should consider doing. But at this time, it's not uh, a procedure that I have personal experience with or is approved by our FDA. Okay, so we've got another question. Um, how often do patients use the cream and can they use in conjunction with retinoids? Um, and what is the recommended protocol for the patients? Um, using yeah, them? well, there's a number of questions there. Uh, first of all, you know, I almost never use retinoids anymore um, because there's so many other uh, skincare products that are way better than retinoids that we have available to us. But one of the problem with many retinoids, as we all know, is irritation. And so I believe that if you are going to use retinoids, uh, using the callosum products along with the retinoids will potentially decrease the inflammatory reaction that you get with the retinoids. And although studies have not been done, my hypothesis is it would increase the efficacy. So you would probably have to do a three-arm study with retinoids versus callosum versus the combination. Um, but my, my theory is it probably would do better. The first part of your question is how often do you use it? Well, as a guy, I don't do things properly. Just guys don't. And so I will use the callosum product uh, once a day. Um, I'll usually use uh, the mask, the MAC mask at night. It's, uh, it's very hydrating. It's calming to your skin. Uh, and my wife actually likes it. Um, and so that's what I do. My wife, however, will use the callosum products twice a day. She'll put on the, the uh, serum and then she'll do either the multi-action cream or if she needs a little more moisturizing, uh, the mask uh, cream. So most of my patients will do it twice a day. Most of the guys will only do it once a day. Okay. Um, we've got a few questions as well um, asking why we use red deer as opposed to other sources. You know, it's interesting. We, we didn't have time to do the whole scientific presentation, but the homology between red deer and human uh, growth factors is in the order of over 99%. So it's really, really good. And then there was this herd of red deer in New Zealand that were just sitting there. 
Um, and so the umbil umbilical cord lining was, was right there to harvest. Um, and it just seemed like a good idea. And so that's why we chose the red deer because either the, the mother eats the umbilical cord and placenta or it's thrown away. So why not harvest it since it has such a good homology? And since at least in, in, in many countries, they don't like to use human products. This is a non-human product that is not harmful at all to harvest. And that's why it was chosen. Hmm. And how much of the serum do we use for post-procedure treatment? What I usually do is the serum, you don't need a lot of it. Um, for those of you that have seen the bottle, it's quite small, uh, only a few mLs in the, in the bottle. And so what we do is we'll put two or three drops on one side of the face, two or three drops on the other. So we're talking drops is all you really need. And it's very common for my patients who are using it uh, post-procedure. And in my patients, they're putting it on three to four times a day because when you do your vinegar water soaks um, and an exfoliation of the skin, then I have my patients put the callosum serum on and then the ointment on on top of it. And so they're using it three or four times a day and that little teeny bottle will last them upwards of a month. Mm. And then we have a few questions just asking about um, any hypersensitivity reactions or adverse events from the serum, I think, in particular. You know, it's amazing. Um, I think I've been using the products now at least for three or three and a half years, and I have not seen any hypersensitivity reactions, nor have I seen acne. And so one of the big problems we have, especially after our laser resurfacing patients, is clogging your pores and getting comedos. And I tell you, we've never seen an acneiform reaction. We've never seen an allergic reaction. We've never seen a sensitivity. So at this point, it's, I think it's a pretty good product. And my experience is probably getting to be near a thousand patients. Uh, post-lasering. Okay. And what is the shelf life of the serum, of all the products, actually? Boy, I, you know what? That's a better question to ask your rep. I'm just a doctor, and so I, I don't know that, but I'm sure someone smarter than me can tell you that, that yeah. uh, answer. We usually say about three years, um, but obviously before the expiry date, and then once opened, ideally within two weeks. Um, yeah. When, when yeah one possible. of the things I do tell my patients is when I, I like them to keep a, the serum in the refrigerator. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you have to, but it's always uh, more soothing to put on something cool in your skin. That's after the laser resurfacing. Yeah. Um, there was another question about what the difference is between the multi-action cream and the restorative hydration cream and whether they need to use both. Well, uh, you know, again, it's one, one difference is concentration of growth factors. The other is the uh, degree of hyaluronic acid and other moisturizing agents. Um, again, this is, this is a question best answered by your representative. But uh, what I tell my patients is you play around with the different creams. Um, when you're a little drier, you want the mask. When you're less dry, you can do the multi-action cream, but it's something to play with. So what will happen if you use the callosum serum uh, daily on the skin instead of um, sort of the whole at-home regime? Instead of the what? Instead of the at-home regime, or I'm guessing after treatments as well. You know, you'll just look younger and younger and more and more beautiful. But uh, what we have found, especially as we showed in that initial study that we did, is your uh, pigmentation gets a little bit better, your dispigmentation, the erythema gets a little bit better, and you see that further lifting of the skin. Um, my patients that use it tend to use it forever. Um, and the reason I can say that is they keep coming back to the clinic every two to three months to buy more product. So it's, it feels good, it doesn't smell, it doesn't irritate, 
And obviously, if patients keep coming back buying more, it means they like it. Okay, I think we have a live question. Um, so just while we're waiting to unmute, um, one question is, do you think it will work as well with uh, post microneedling procedures? <clears throat> you know, yes. Um, I do a lot of um, radiofrequency microneedling, especially for acne scars and on people of color. Um, my esthetician <laughs> does regular microneedling and it's part of uh, our regimen. Mm -hmm. So when we treat any patient with microneedling, whether it's radiofrequency or regular microneedling or any laser <laughs> this is part of our post-operative regimen. Okay. Um, Dr. Warafong, you've been um, unmuted, so. Yes. Hello, Mitch. Hi. Dr. Ah, sawadee Sawadee yes. Kap. I have one question. That does the calcium help to reduce the incidence of post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation I... after doing laser in dark skin patients? Uh, you're so smart. Uh, it's amazing. Well, as, as you know, but I'll tell all the other people, to 200 plus people listening, you've written some incredibly good papers on the incidence of post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation after laser resurfacing. It was a key interest of yours when you were uh, the fellow of myself and Dr. Fitzpatrick. And so this is a very appropriate question. The answer is, I don't know. Um, because we didn't, we don't have a lot of PIH anymore in our patients uh, with the way we're doing it. In fact, you know, Dr. Ott, I don't think I've had a patient with PIH since I've been using the callosum. But this is something I think you should do this study on your patients with or without callosum, the incidence of PIH. Um, in my office, we really haven't seen PIH since we've been doing callosum, but I cannot tell you that it's because of the callosum. It could be a variety of different things. Mm. Very good. I would love to, that, to do that study with you. Oh, but you can even do it yourself much better than with me, but uh, it's really good to hear your voice. And I hope that you and your family are have very safe and happy in this crazy time. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mitch. Okay. Okay. Dr. Valencia, you've also been unmuted. Yes. Um, does it improve the dark circles and wrinkles around the eyes? Hi, another great question. <laughs> um, is, you know, see, the, the beauty of this product is there are possibilities for, as Dr. Odd said, decreasing PIH, and as you're saying, decreasing dark circles but we haven't done that study yet. Now, the problem, of course, with dark circles is there's a number of different reasons. There is a genetic reason, there is a melanocytic reason, there is a vascular re reason with extravasation of red blood cells. So there's many different reasons to have dark circles. Um, but I think it's really worth a study. Where right now we're doing studies with a variety of different picosecond lasers on uh, dark circles and my um, associate, Dr. Douglas Wu, um, has just published a number of studies uh, using uh, 532 and um, 755 picosecond lasers on dark circles. I th we did not, because we wanted it to be a pure laser study, we did not have patients on callosum. But I think that that would be a very, very smart thing to do. And again, this is yet another study which really needs to be done. Thank you. Okay. So we'll just wait for Ali has name to be unmuted. There we go. Hi, good morning. Hi. Hello. Hi, yes. good morning. Uh, I'm, uh, I am uh, Dr. Ali, senior dermatologist from Pakistan. 
really a mind blowing and enlightening lecture given by you i am interested to just to know that is this product available in pakistan i'll leave that to laura and nick i don't know i am not 100% sure uh okay not if not available here then how can i get it accessed from my, my patients here Hi, Dr. Hasnain. Um, this is Nick here from Callison Professional. Uh, what I can do is I can email you details of uh, how to get the products in Pakistan uh, following the webinar. That would be very kind and grateful of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Take care. Thanks. Okay, so we've got another question. Um, here, uh, can you use it for melasma, the serum? You know, as many of us know, melasma is a very, very difficult condition to treat. Um, I wish I knew how to treat all of melasma. We know that mel melasma is also many different types. There's melasma associated with an underlying uh, increased vasculature. Um, there's melasma that's associated mostly with hormones. There's melasma associated with different types of light. And then there's melasma that uh, can be associated with a variety of combinations of those three and even more. And so again, I don't know the answer. There's certainly no reason not to use it in a melasma patient. Whether it would add to the efficacy, I'm just not sure because no one has uh, studied it. But since melasma is such a difficult problem, I think it's definitely worth a try. When you think of the mechanism of action of the mesenchymal growth factors, it would only be its, its anti-inflammatory component that would help with melasma. Um, and maybe it would, it's just, I don't know the, the answer. And so yet another study. Okay. And then, so aside from facial skin, can the products also be applied on other areas of the skin to improve skin texture or reduce wrinkling? You know, it depends how much money you have. Um, the reason most people will use uh, skincare products on your, their face is because it's a small area. Um, I definitely think it can be, and I do use it on the neck. And so patients that I'm doing radiofrequency microneedling to the neck, we also use the callosum. And then the decollete area on the chest, we also use it. But can you bathe in callosum? I don't know the, the right answer. I'm sure if you're rich enough, yes, you can bathe in it. But at this point, I've only had experience in using it on the face, the neck, and the chest. Mm -hmm. um, have you ever done any studies with other skin conditions such as sunburn or allergic reaction? We've also had a question about eczema using the products with that. Yeah, the answer is no. I, I have not done those studies, nor have I used the product uh, on patients with sunburn or eczema or allergic uh, dermatitis. Uh, we, you know, we, we really shouldn't think that this is a product that treats everything in the universe. Um, we've really concentrated on photo rejuvenation and anti-aging. Um, yes, maybe it could be used for other conditions. At this point, I don't have the knowledge to know if, if it's going to be successful in the other conditions. Mm -hmm. Um, another question is, what is the concentration of protein media in the recovery night complex gel? Uh, again, that's something, Nick, or you can answer. Uh, I, I have not memorized all the concentrations. Um, so for the recovery night complex is 40% um, cord lining condition media, which are the, is the proteins. Um, and then there was another question about the concentration in the multi-action cream versus the restorative hydration cream. There are 50% and then the serum is 80%. Um, 
Um, so there's a question about the product effectivity for rosacea. Um, yeah, I, again, yet, yet another condition why, while it may be effective because of its anti-inflammatory components, um, to the best of my knowledge, we have not done a study, and I don't know of a study being done in rosacea, but again, rosacea is not just one condition. There's many different kinds of rosacea, um, and I just don't know if callosum would be the first topical that I would use uh, to treat rosacea. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think we have James Tan, he's still muted. Um, so we'll do this as the um, last question and any questions that we haven't answered in the Q&A box, we'll email you directly um, to answer those questions. Um, okay, James Tan, you're unmuted now. Can pregnant lady customers use the serum or the, any of the keratin products? Boy, I'm so sorry, I didn't hear the question. Okay, can pregnant customers use the keratin product, uh, be it the serum or the uh, uh, multi-action cream? Mm -hmm. So pregnant customers, can they use the serum oh. or multi-action cream? You know, I don't see why they can't. Um, even even the, the TNS growth factor creams, um, although, you know, the, the the legal answer is no, you can't do anything if you're pregnant because no one has done clinical studies on pregnant uh, women with any cream uh, practically in the universe. But I can't see any reason why it would have any effect. Um, the product is not systemic. It basically acts where you put it. Um, so, but. Technically, I don't know the correct answer because no one has tested pregnant women. Okay, thank you, Dr. Norman. Okay, so any, as I said, any other questions that we haven't answered in the chat or the Q&A, we'll um, send you an email after this. Um, but thank you so much, Dr. Goldman, for your time. Um, and I hope you have a fantastic rest of your evening. And thank yeah. you everyone for coming online. We hope we answered um, most of your questions. If you have and any I hope to be able to see all of you live one day uh, in your countries as soon as this uh, crazy crisis is over. Definitely. So if you have any other questions, uh, please send an email to customerservice at callison.com or alternatively uh, contact your local account representative here from Callison. Um, and you should receive some more information on our next episode in our webinar series very soon. Um, and there's a short feedback form at the end. So if you have a chance, uh, it would be great to hear what you thought as our first one. Um, stay safe and thank you all very much.